Hello and welcome back to The Effect. Uh, we are talking about matching, and in the last video we talked about distance matching as being a way of selecting matches between two different observations, uh, two different sets of observations, uh, where we are literally picking the observations that have the least distance between them on the set of matching variables that we have. But actually the most common way, probably, of applying matching is with a different method called propensity score matching. And here's the idea behind that. So let's think back to the whole purpose of all this. Why are we bothering to do matching or regression or any of this in the first place? Well, the idea is that we want to close back doors, right? We think we want to look at the relationship between X and Y. We want to know the effect, the causal effect of X on Y. Uh, but we have all these backdoor variables that are driving that relationship uh, such that when we look in the data, we're going to see some sort of correlation that does not reflect the causal effect. So we want to control for that backdoor stuff. Now, closing all those back doors doesn't necessarily mean that we have to close off all the variation with those variables. I mean, that's not really our goal. Our goal is not to close off those variables. Our goal is to close the back doors. If we can isolate just the part of those variables that are driving the variation in treatment, then that should be good enough. Sort of the idea here is that we have all these backdoor variables, but those backdoor variables do all sorts of things, right? And only part of what they do is affect treatment. Right? And if we can close off the part of those variables that affects treatment, that, that determines whether somebody is treated or not, uh, and just control for that, well, then we've done our job of closing the back doors. That is the propensity score. The propensity score is the probability that somebody is going to be treated. And the idea of propensity score matching is that we're going to try to predict your propensity, predict your propensity for being treated. What is the probability that you are going to be treated based on the matching variables that I have for you? And once I have that probability, uh, I can use it to try to, to figure out who your best kinds of matches are, who is most like you in terms of how likely you are to be treated. Because if we can control for how likely you are to be treated, that's the real thing we're actually trying to do with all these backdoor closures. Uh, so if we can do that, it's okay. We don't necessarily have to control for all the individual variables as long as we can control for this propensity score. This is typically done with a probit or logit model, uh, where we simply take whether or not you are treated and regress it on the set of matching variables, and then use that to predict the probability that you are treated. There is your estimated propensity score. Done. Uh, now, probit and logit are the only way to do it. They're just the most common. Uh, especially nowadays, you might see more and more machine learning applications trying to predict the propensity score, uh, which makes sense, right? This is a prediction problem. We're trying to predict your probability of being treated. And what's machine learning really good at? Prediction. So maybe let it do that. Uh, but probit and logit are, also, are still the most common ways of predicting that propensity score. Now, the fact that we are using regression to do this does mean a couple of things. It means that, you know, when I talked about why are we doing matching, well, one good thing about matching is it doesn't rely so much on linearity assumptions like regression does, but now we are doing a regression, so that assumption sort of comes back in. However, uh, this does mean that we can take a bunch of predictors, a bunch of matching variables, and combine them all together in a way that's a lot more uh, able to handle high numbers of matching variables than certainly distance matching. We don't get the curse of dimensionality in the same way because we are really sort of collapsing together all the different uh, matching variables because we're not looking at each of those different distances independently. Uh, we all really are going ourselves back to a single dimension, uh, which does not have the curse of dimensionality because there's only one dimension. A lot easier in that way. So. We are using probit or logit or something else to predict the probability that you are treated, uh, and then that is your propensity. Now, a common thing that you will likely see is that you pick matches, right? Your propensity, let's say you have an 80% chance of being uh, being treated, and you are treated, and then we would find somebody who is not treated but has a 79% chance or an 81% chance. We're gonna say that that person is your best match. Now, there's a problem with that. Uh, it's been shown uh, that using a propensity score to pick the best set of matches actually has some statist statistical issues. It doesn't work all that well. Uh, so I mentioned the different ways of doing matching. You can either pick a set of matched observations or you can construct a set of weights. We actually don't want to do the set of matched observations uh, if we are doing propensity score matching. We would rather use the weighting approach. And the way that the weighting approach is this. Uh, we say that you have an 80% chance of being treated uh, We would, and you are treated. And so we would weight you. We would give you a weight that is the inverse of your probability of being treated. Uh, so the people who are most likely to be treated and are treated are going to get the lowest weights because this allows them to look the most like the control group, right? The control group didn't get treated. So if we want to pick treated observations that are like the control group, then we should pick the people who are least likely to get treated the most. We should treat them as giving the heavy, heaviest weights. Similarly, on the control side, we are going to take uh, do the inverse of the probability that they're not treated. So the people who were least likely to be treated are going to get the lowest weights because we want to pick people who are the most likely treated group, right? Treated group did get uh, treated, so I want to pick people over here who are most likely to be treated and yet weren't. 
Uh, that's going to give us a good comparison group because uh, we're going to get the people who are least likely to get treated but were treated and the people who are most likely to get treated and didn't get treated and likely those are going to be pretty decent comparisons for each other or at least that's the idea behind inverse probability weighting as a way of using the propensity score. Now, there are a couple of difficulties with doing propensity scores, I mean, as with any method. Uh, one might be outcome already apparent to you with this idea of inverse probability weighting, where we are dividing by the inverse uh, of the probability that you are treated, uh, which is that this whole method sort of runs into problems if the probability of being treated is near one or near zero. Because uh, if you have a near zero probability of being treated, but you were treated, then your weight would be something like one divided by zero, which you can't really do. Uh, or if your probability of being treated is near one uh, and you were not treated, then your weight would be something like one divided by almost zero. Again, a big of a problem. Uh, so a common thing that you might do in propensity score matching is to take the propensity score and trim it uh, such that you might drop people with really, really high or really, really low probabilities of being treated. Something else you have to keep in mind when doing propensity score matching are the issues of common support and balance. Uh, now, these are things we're going to come back to a little bit later on, so I'll talk about them pretty briefly here. Uh, but the idea of common support is, well, hey, you know, we're trying to pick the, un the control group who is most like the treated group, who has the most highest probability of being treated. Are there, is there anybody actually like that? Is there anybody who wasn't treated but had a high chance of being treated? Uh, there might not be, right? Uh, similarly, is there anybody who was treated but had a low chance of being treated? There might not be that either. Uh, if we simply don't have any people to compare who are treated but like the non-treated or non-treated but like the treated, then we lack common support and propensity score matching simply might not work that well. At the best, you can improve your chances here by simply dropping people who have probabilities where nobody on the other side. So let's say that, you know, there's nobody in the control group who had an 80% or better chance of being treated. Well, then I'd drop all the people over here who had an 80% chance of being treated or better and only use the people who are more like the control group. Of course, when we're doing this, we are dropping observations, which sort of leads us into that bias variance trade-off thing again. I won't drag us back there. Uh, balance is another issue that comes up a lot in propensity score matching. Uh, unlike distance matching, propensity score matching is not really picking observations in an attempt to make the control, the matching variables actually similar between these groups. You could easily end up with a propensity score outcome uh, where the actual matching variables look very different in these two groups. Like, think about it. Like, let's say we're matching, again, on the size of our April credit card bill and how old we are. And let's say that both of those things uh, increase the probability that we are going to not pay our April bill. Okay, well, let's say that we got one person over here who has a really high April bill but is very young, and the other person over here who is very old but has a very low April bill. Both of those people might be predicted to have the same probability of not paying their bill. Uh, and so if I'm matching to one or the other of them, I might end up with, some, uh, with a bill that does not match very well but an age that matches great. Uh, and so we might end up with a group that is very well matched on their propensity score, um, but is not very well matched on the individual variables. And when this happens, we have a failure of balance. And, you know, technically the whole idea of this is that if we control for the propensity score, who cares about the individual variables, but it still doesn't look great. It's a bit suspicious if we have a good propensity score match, but not very good uh, balance on the individual variables. So a common thing to do when you do propensity score matching is to check whether the matching variables that you have used look at least kind of similar between the treated and control groups. Now, if they don't, if you have bad common support or bad balance, uh, you might then want to go back to your propensity score uh, uh, estimation and change some things. Uh, maybe you add some polynomial terms uh, in your estimation of the propensity score. Maybe you add or remove some of the matching variables that you have selected. Uh, but this is a common thing with matching procedures generally, the sort of check and return approach. You do some sort of matching estimation, some sort of matching method, you pick your matches, then you do things like you check your common support and balance. If they're bad, uh, then it looks like your matching didn't work very well, and maybe you need to go back and try some other things until your matching looks like it worked a bit better. All right, so that is the concept behind propensity score matching, one of the most common ways of doing matching. We estimate our propensity score by some sort of method. Uh, we then check whether we have decent balance and support. If not, we go back and we try some other things for estimating it. Uh, once we have our propensity score, uh, we might uh, pick matches, although that's not a great idea. We're probably going to be more likely to use inverse probability weighting uh, to pick the treated observations that were least likely to get treated and the untreated observations that were most likely to get treated and weight them accordingly. Uh, now, of course, this whole check and go back method uh, means we might have to iteratively do our whole matching procedure a whole bunch of times, which is kind of annoying. Thankfully, though, there are some alternate methods that don't require us to do that, and we will talk about those in the next video. Thank you. Thank you.